You are listening to We Saw the Devil, an investigative and conversational true crime podcast that deep dives into fascinating criminal cases that are solved, unsolved, or ongoing. From America's Lori Vallow to Jeremy's Armin Mivas, we examine and discuss the world's most shocking cases. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to follow us online. Check us out at WeSawTheDevil.com and we saw the Devil on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can become part of the show by backing us on Patreon. Hello, everyone. You are listening to We Saw the Devil. This is Robin, and I am super excited for this episode. This is an episode that I didn't expect. It's one of the best kinds. You you just start reading something and you become fascinated with it, and then you just stay up all night, like the meme of where, you know, sorry, can't do anything tonight. I'm going to stay at home and solve the John Benet Ramsey case. Kind of had that moment with this episode, uh, doing the research. I mean, I have read probably 40, 50, 60 hours on this case. It's even more. It is ridiculous. So I'm super excited to put this out. This is 100% going to be a multi-episode series. And don't worry, I haven't forgotten about the Cannibal series. That episode part two, well, part two is coming this week as well. I just happen to get sucked into a rabbit hole that I personally find very interesting. So we will get into that in a moment. First, let's get our quick housekeeping out of the way. You are listening to We Saw the Devil. I'm Robin. You can find our website at wesawthedevil.com. And from there, you can find us all across social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and so forth. You can also find us if you're digging the show and you want to financially back it. uh, You can do so at our Patreon, which is at patreon.com forward slash we saw the devil. For as little as $3 a month, you can support the show, get stuff like stickers, postcards, uh, swag, depending on your, your support level, and executive producers, which is $25 and up, get a t-shirt, and the ability to come on the show, like cover a topic, cover their favorite case, and come on the show. Beyond that, I do have some really exciting news. The rebrand is coming. God, last year I talked about how when I started this podcast, I really didn't expect it to go anywhere. And I just made a really quick, easy logo in Canva myself, which I'm like Ray Charles when it comes to graphic design. I've really hated our logo, to be perfectly honest. And so I hired a graphic designer and have a new logo, guys. People on our Patreon have seen it. I want to give ample warning so that people who If you haven't officially subscribed or even subscribers who may not recognize a new logo or a new look for the show, I wanted to give ample opportunity for you guys to understand and know that that is coming. So in about two or three weeks, you will see all of our social media as well as Apple iTunes, the cover art for the podcast. It will be completely different. So just be aware in the upcoming episodes that you are going to see a switch, but it is still the same show and nothing has happened. And finally, last announcement, guys, I am super, super, super excited to announce that this next week, I'm going to be interviewing a very special guest. I know a lot of you on our social media, you've been talking about uh, the new show on NBC coming called The Thing About Pam. A lot of you love the episodes that we did on the Pam Hupp case, that insane case uh, where Pam Hupp basically murdered her best friend, framed her husband, probably killed her own mother, and framed uh, another man. Goodness only knows what that woman has done in totality. But yeah, NBC has actually created a show and it's coming in the, it's coming next month. So this next week, I'm actually going to be interviewing Russ Faria's attorney, Joel Schwartz. He was there from the very beginning when Pam Hub's best friend, Betsy, was murdered. Russ was framed for her murder, was convicted, and spent time in prison. Joel, his attorney, never gave up and was with him until the very, very, very end when he was finally released when they realized that he did not do it. Really, really excited to talk to him. I know that the Pam Hupp case is is terrifying. It's horrifying. um, And it literally gripped the country when it happened because people just really could not believe it. So really excited. Uh, That is going to be airing probably two weeks, the week after next. But let's go ahead and get into today's episode. There are fewer glamorous people in the history of the world than Marilyn Monroe. Uh, When you think about Marilyn Monroe, or when I think about Marilyn Monroe, I think about the blonde hair, I think about the mole, I think about the dress, I think about the happy birthday to you. I mean, it's made fun of and mentioned. It is a pillar of pop culture at this point. 
people dress up as her. People enact things that she did, mimic her. I mean, she is an absolute icon in almost every single part of society, uh, from Playboy to fashion to Hollywood, all of it. And I didn't realize, because I've never really I hate to say it, but I've never really been interested in glamour, right? Like in the glamorous Hollywood. I always looked at her and I said, she appears to be a very sad woman. I guess I'm on a kick. I've been reading uh, Marlene Dietrich's book. I read a book on Betty Davis, and I'm kind of getting into the old Hollywood, the 20s and 30s, the personalities. You know what I mean? So I was just really bored. I'm like, I should read about Marilyn Monroe. I know nothing about her. How about I educate myself? And I have been in a rabbit hole for two solid weeks now. And what I didn't realize is the sheer amount of controversy surrounding her death. I always knew it, you know, talking to my parents. Well, she was probably murdered. Was she murdered? Wasn't she murdered? Was it an actual overdose? So on and so forth. So I started reading and it is a doozy. This episode, this series is going to be broken into just two parts because, guys, it's a long one. This is going to be the story of Marilyn Monroe and then following up on the evidence, uh, rumors, and conspiracy theories surrounding how she died. So Marilyn Monroe was actually born Norma Jean Mortensen on June 1st, 1926 in Los Angeles to a woman by the name of Gladys Baker. Gladys had moved to the Los Angeles area in order to follow her dreams of being, ironically, a Hollywood starlet. But that didn't happen. She never became an actress or achieved any level of fame whatsoever. Instead, she was left with a 9-to-5 job splicing film at a local motion picture company, RKO. And she was barely making enough money to cover her rent. It was pretty dire. It also didn't help that she started to have an affair with a male manager at her work by the name of Sandy Gifford. Gladys got pregnant, and even though she told Sandy about the pregnancy, he wanted nothing to do with the baby, the pregnancy, or Gladys, for that matter. Norma Jean's birth certificate officially lists her father as a man by the name of Edward Mortensen, who was actually Gladys's second husband, but he was long gone from the picture at the time that she became pregnant. So the fact that he was actually not, who would go on to be known as Marilyn Monroe's father. This devastating loss from not having a father would absolutely haunt Norma Jean throughout her life, and it would have profound consequences, which we will discuss throughout this episode. Gladys suffered from paranoid schizophrenia, and her mental health took a very sharp turn downward after Norma Jean was born. Norma would go on to be known as Norma Jean Baker at her baptism. And Gladys's various mental disorders, in addition to being a single mom who had almost no money, It was just too much for her, and she eventually was institutionalized. And Gladys's entire family had a history of mental instability. Her parents, Otis and Delia Monroe, both lived their final days out in mental hospitals. They died in them. Gladys's brother, Marion Monroe, was also officially diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. And unfortunately, Gladys was too. She actually spent the vast majority of Norma Jean's childhood in and out of mental institutions. So the young Norma Jean was bounced around among relatives, family friends, and multiple orphanages. Ida and Albert Bolander were her foster parents for the first eight years of her life. And at age eight, Norma Jean was sent to live with a woman uh, named Grace McKee, who was her mother's best friend. And Grace quickly received the name Aunt Grace from Norma Jean. Aunt Grace cared for Norma Jean at the age of eight for that year. And she eventually no longer could afford to do so. Uh, She also worked for a a motion picture company, Columbia Pictures. On September 13th, 1935, she was forced to bring Norma Jean to the Los Angeles Orphans Home Society, which is now known as the Holly Grove Home for Children. And the Holly Grove Home for Children, uh, where Marilyn Monroe spent a little bit of time, actually just recently closed in 2014. In a 1962 interview, Marilyn discussed what she said as Aunt Grace dropped her off at the orphanage. She said, quote, I began to cry. Please, please don't make me go inside. I'm not an orphan. My mother's not dead. I'm not an orphan. It's just that she's sick in the hospital and can't take care of me. Please don't make me live in an orphan's home. Norma Jean stayed at that orphanage on and off for a period of almost two years. During those two years, she went to 11 different foster homes and was molested by multiple foster fathers. In one interview where Marilyn discusses the first time she was raped, she explained how she told the foster mother what had happened, 
and the foster mother slapped her and said, I don't believe you. Now, during the Depression, the number of couples who took in foster children just absolutely skyrocketed. I mean, of course, it was a horrible time in history, economically speaking, and they would receive money from the state for watching over children. Except there were so many children, and it was the Depression, so controls and safety were not at the forefront of each placement. By this time, Aunt Grace had found some semblance of financial security and ended up remarried, this time to a man named Doc Goddard. She sent for Norma Jean, and Norma lived with her for less than a year. It was also during this time that Aunt Grace let Norma Jean know that she had a half-sister named Bernice who lived in Kentucky. And Norma Jean finally didn't feel as alone in the world. She didn't have a father. Her mother was alive but was too sick to actually be with her. So Norma Jean and Bernice began writing each other regularly, and they actually formed a close bond as pen pals. However, like almost everything in Norma's life, that happiness didn't last because Aunt Grace's new husband had also started trying to molest Norma Jean. In a later interview, Marilyn Monroe recounted how Grace had replied, quote, I can't trust anyone or anything. It became clear that she could not stay there. So instead of sending Norma Jean back to the orphanage, Grace sent her to live with her aunt, Olive Brunings. At this point, Norma Jean was 13 years old, and she ended up being violently raped by her cousin. All we know is that he was a boy named Jack. From there, Norma Jean briefly lived with Aunt Grace again before moving in with a 61-year-old family friend named Edith Anna Lower. And the match was perfect. Norma received a brief period of stability for the very first time in her entire life. And all during this time, and all of the confusion of people coming and going in and out of her life, Gladys, her mother, was still writing and trying to see Norma Jean. In fact, sporadically through all of this, Gladys would come out, she would see Norma Jean, she would take, get an apartment, get set up, and then take Norma Jean for like sometimes even a week, sometimes a month or two. But nevertheless, she would have to give her right back up because she couldn't keep either her mental health or her financial security stable. As she blossomed into her teen years, her figure blossomed too. And for the first time, she was seen by others. She talks distinctly in journals and interviews about how she felt invisible as a child. So when she came to be about 15 years old in 1941, she felt seen because of the attention that she was getting. At the age of 15, she was attending Van Nuys High School and living with Edith Anna Lower. And it was early wartime at this point, 1941. Don't forget, early, early World War II. They simply could not afford to care for Norma Jean any longer, and so they decided that they would try to marry her off. And they did. Norma Jean was introduced to a 20-year-old man by the name of James Darty, a local football star and previous student body president at Van Nuys High School. James worked at the local Lockheed Martin aviation plant and was basically as normal as he could possibly be. James was greatly concerned about how young she was, but he considered the alternative of her going back into the foster care system because she was staying with the family and friends who were about to move, putting her back into an orphanage or foster home. And in all of the interviews that James uh, Doherty did throughout the years, he claims that he wasn't interested in her because she was too young. Initially, she was too young, and he approached her basically to keep her out of an orphanage, that he respected her, he liked her, she was a nice kid. And he, it was a sham marriage. It was a setup. It was an arranged marriage. Uh, later on, he claims that they did, in fact, fall in love. But regardless, only a couple weeks after her 16th birthday, 21-year-old James Dotery and 16-year-old Norma got married. And Norma had just turned 16 on June 1st and then ended up marrying James on June 19th, just 18 days later. Edith Anna Lower is the one who gave Norma away because she had no father in her life to walk her down the aisle. Looking back on this period in her life, Marilyn would claim that she had not been in love at all, that it was just merely the less punishing option on the table at the time. She claimed the marriage was loveless and that she was bored out of her mind, although she did admit that Jim was a good provider and very kind to her. Jim Dotery, on the other hand, recalls it very differently. He claimed that they were madly in love and that she had been a great, attentive wife. They traveled extensively, went on trips, vacations together, had many friends, went skiing, and appeared to all to be happily in love. But like everything else in Norma's life, it was short-lived. The drumbeat of World War II had reached the United States, and Jim signed with the Merchant Marines. She wanted to remain active, so she did what many other GI wives did at the time. 
she got a job at the radio plane company in Burbank. Her first job? Inspecting parachutes. But she was quickly promoted to spraying liquid plastic on fuselages. And Norma Jean's life would be charted for a different course here. One day in 1945, Army photographer David Conover visited the plant in order to shoot photographs of women working to help the war effort. He was looking for a woman who was beautiful and belonged on the cover of a magazine that the GIs would appreciate while being away from home. A morale booster, if you will. At the plant, he saw 18-year-old Norma Jean Dotery working away, wearing the company overalls. So he snapped a few pictures and suggested to her that she get into modeling. And that moment is where it all began. First, she continued doing photo shoots with David Conover. He was the army photographer for the first motion picture unit, which operated through Hal Roach Studios. And fun fact, David Conover's commanding officer was actually Ronald Reagan. David Conover was friends with a commercial photographer named Potter Huth, and David showed Potter some photographs of Norma Jean that he'd taken, and he immediately wanted to work with her. Potter Huth paid Norma Jean $5 an hour for spec jobs. That's where she takes pictures and she makes no money unless they are sold. Uh, but he did actually pay her $5 an hour for, the, for that time. She posed at night after work. So she kept her day job and then also started doing this at night on the side. She became a very hot commodity very quickly. Her pictures started selling out. Norma Jean's pictures eventually wound up on the desk of Emmeline Snively, the head of the Blue Book Model Agency in Los Angeles. They brought her in for some jobs, enrolled her in their modeling classes, and it was during this time where Norma Jean made the change from her, quote, brown and kinky hair, as one stylist described it, to the classic blonde for which she would be known to the world. For as fast as her success was happening, so too was the end of her marriage to Jim Dotery. Still living with Jim's family, Jim's mother kept insisting that Norma Jean write to Jim to ask for permission to get involved in modeling. Norma Jean was not one to be controlled after tasting such success and freedom. And this became apparent when Jim would visit her while at home on leave. He found modeling trashy and unbecoming a woman of her status. He was displeased at the high bills for clothes and the fact that she was spending his money, his GI wages, on clothes, makeup, and hair. When he was around Norma Jean, all conversation turned to her career. And when he did have time off, Norma Jean always had a shoot to go to. And he finally gave her an ultimatum. You can be my wife or you can be a model, but you cannot be both. So what does she do? After Jim was sent back to war, she actually moved to Nevada to establish residency so she could file for divorce while he was away and ensure that he would sign the papers. She'd previously written him almost daily while he was deployed. But at this point, after Jim had given her the ultimatum, all of the letters stopped. Instead, divorce papers were sent. Jim refused to sign them until he returned home. And he returned in fall of 1946, and within two weeks, Norma Jean Baker was out of his life for good. Norma Jean would go on to have a very successful pinup modeling career. And I think a lot of people, including myself, I wasn't aware that she was actually a pinup model before she got into acting. But her photos eventually landed on the desk of Daryl Zunick, the head of production at 20th Century Fox. He offered Norma Jean a contract of $75 a week for six months, possibly being renewed every six months thereafter. And Norma Jean accepted. And to celebrate her new endeavors and her new job and success, she went out to celebrate with friends. And by friends, I mean her work acquaintances and the people that she was working with. Norma Jean and Marilyn Monroe never really had many friends. The first order of their business was changing her name. Norma Jean Baker or Norma Jean Dotery just didn't have a ring to it. Marilyn was based on the actress Marilyn Miller, and Norma Jean used her mother's family name, Monroe. So Marilyn Monroe was born. Now, this episode isn't going to be just a straight-up biography on Marilyn Monroe. I feel like there are ample films, books, websites, all dedicated to that. What I would like to do is cover some of the darker times in her life, some of the biggest events, and then also, like I said earlier in the intro of this episode, uh, the conspiracies surrounding her death in the next one. So let's go ahead and let's start in the early 1950s. Uh, At this time, Marilyn was currently rising to fame. 
Her first film was Ladies of the Chorus in 1948, and she appeared in films like The Asphalt Jungle in 1949, which did so well that it actually gave her a role in the legendary film, one of my favorite films of all time, the 1950s film All About Eve, uh, which starred Betty Davis. And arguably, that is also Betty Davis's best film. Absolute blockbuster of a movie. And along the way, along her initial films, Marilyn took almost every single director that she had as a lover. In 1952, Marilyn fell in love with retired baseball player Joe DiMaggio, who at that time was considered the best baseball player to have ever lived. Their relationship immediately became tabloid fodder. I mean, they were both legends of their own careers. At this point, Marilyn wasn't quite at the height, but she was like the new hot thing in Hollywood. And Joe DiMaggio at this point was just, uh, he was a living legend. So this was huge, huge, huge news. 1953 was probably the most formative year. Gentlemen Prefer Blondes skyrocketed Marilyn Monroe's star to the moon, specifically with the musical number, Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. And on that note, I want you, listener, to stop what you are doing and watch the YouTube video of that. That is quintessential Marilyn Monroe. That performance, singularly, more than any other, shows Marilyn in her prime and makes you realize why she was loved so much by men who wanted to bed her and then also women who wanted to be like her. I had actually never seen that before. Again, I was never really a Marilyn Monroe fan, so I never really sought out her work. And I've watched like five of her movies just in in preparing for this episode. And Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend is just so completely iconic. Madonna did a version of it. That dress, it's a pink dress. It's iconic. That is what you need to stop, drop, and watch. Also in 1953, the first issue of Playboy magazine hit the shelves, and it actually featured a very nude Marilyn Monroe. But here's the thing. Marilyn Monroe hadn't actually posed for Hugh Hefner directly. In fact, Hugh Hefner purchased the photos locally from a calendar store in Chicago and then ran them in the magazine. He had a friend who owned the calendar store, and he was able to to do it. In 1949, a very broke and unemployed Marilyn Monroe posed nude for Tom Kelly, a famous pinup photographer, in exchange for $50 that she desperately needed to make a car payment. Those photos were never published, and after Marilyn became a superstar, Hugh Hefner bought them and then ran them in Playboy, legally without Marilyn Monroe's consent. The very first Playboy magazine cover read, First time in any magazine, Full color, Marilyn Monroe, nude. And it proved to be fruitful on Hef's end because the first copy sold 53,991 copies at 50 cents a piece. However, this almost ruined her career. For a mainstream star to be caught in, you know, a new smut mag, back in the day when Playboy originally came out, it was controversial. I mean, it was considered trash and it almost ruined her career. The studio freaked out that it would make her look like a harlot and movie theaters would pull her films. In fact, movie theaters, when the news broke, actually threatened to pull all of the films that she starred in. And not only that, but the tabloids had been looking into Marilyn Monroe's background and discovered that her mother was not dead. You see, Gladys had been in a mental institution almost this entire time. And rather than explain that to the press, Marilyn Monroe just told everyone that her mother was dead. But instead of using a slick PR move to cover all of that up or explain it away, Marilyn decided to make her own statement and just be honest about everything. And it worked. And the public, even her most conservative and staunchest critics, forgave her for it. However, the studio was lukewarm about it. After the success of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, Marilyn felt as though she deserved better roles. She had become known as a bit of a diva. She was showing up late on set. She was acting out with attention-seeking behaviors and so on. Not to mention that she was very, very, very sexual with her male co-stars. She was frustrated with scripts on the table, so she basically decided to say fuck it and marry Joe DiMaggio. On January 14th, 1954, Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn Monroe eloped in San Francisco. The big quote from this is Monroe told a friend, quote, except for Joe, I've sucked my last cock. The marriage immediately had a set of ground rules. And of course, these rules came from Joe DiMaggio. 
DiMaggio had to approve of all of her films. Marilyn Monroe was never to be semi-dressed, and she had to work to break out of the dumb blonde typecasting that Hollywood had put her in. But regardless, she was never to outdo him. She was always to fly under his radar and be in support of him and never do anything above, above him. When she did, Joe DiMaggio would sleep in another bedroom and go days without speaking to her. Marilyn Monroe had just one request of her new husband. If she died before him, she wanted him to promise to place flowers at her grave every week. And Joe DiMaggio promised. Marilyn's relationship with Joe DiMaggio, if you're not getting the picture, was toxic. And in fact, calling it toxic is a grave, grave, grave understatement. And this could best be summed up in a letter that she wrote to a friend just a couple months after her and DiMaggio's marriage. She said, quote, I married Joe with love. I thought I was going to have a good life. I thought we were going to have a decent marriage. I thought we were going to have a relationship as husband and as a wife and all the things that are entailed in a good marriage. And I've discovered that the man is absolutely obsessed with jealousy and possessiveness. He doesn't want to know about my business. He doesn't want to know about my work as an actress. He doesn't want to associate with any of my friends. He wants to cut me off completely from the whole world of motion pictures, friends, and creative people that I know. Joe DiMaggio wanted a stay-at-home housewife. He was incredibly insecure in his marriage to, quote, the most beautiful woman in the world. Marilyn and Joe would frequently get into horrible fights over her career or even just male work acquaintances or associates that she would meet with. The marriage was the second one for both of them, and Joe had a son from his first marriage who would live with them part-time. Later on, after Marilyn's death, he would recount that his father would physically assault and even beat Marilyn. He witnessed it himself. And Marilyn would pretend that everything was fine for his sake as a child. And it wasn't only at home. He would slap or hit Marilyn at dinner parties or in the homes of his friends. He wasn't ashamed of it and even told his friends that she was crazy, she was self-centered, and she brought out the worst in him. Direct quote. The physical abuse began immediately on their honeymoon. Even Joe DiMaggio's son, again, witnessed it on their honeymoon. In one interview, he recalled being woken up by the fighting. He said, quote, I was asleep downstairs. I woke up to the sound of my father and Marilyn screaming. After a few minutes, I heard Marilyn race down the stairs and out the front door and my father running after her. He caught up to her and grabbed her by the hair and sort of half dragged her back into the house. She was trying to fight him off, but couldn't. But the final straw for this marriage came from the film The Seven Year Itch. You know the one. It has the infamous scene where Marilyn's skirt blows up over the subway grate and she tries to push it back down. It's been recreated a billion different times in pop culture. I mean, it is one of the most iconic film scenes of all time. Well, that scene was reshot many, 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 many times in public, and the studio used it as a sort of PR stunt. Joe DiMaggio was actually present for the filming of it, and he absolutely lost his ever-loving shit seeing everyone out in public gawking at his wife. It was quite a big thing. Hundreds of people gathered around the film set and watched them reshoot this over and over and over again. And he couldn't stand watching it anymore. So he returned to their hotel room around the corner. After the scene was finalized, Marilyn signed autographs, said goodnight, and also went up to her room. The moment she walked in the door, Joe DiMaggio attacked her. He beat her and dragged her around the room by her hair. It was so violent and loud that multiple hotel guests called the front desk, urging them to call the police. And this is the early 1950s, guys. He was beating her that horribly and violently. It sounded like someone was actually getting hurt. The next day, Marilyn arrived on set and Gladys Witten, a studio hairdresser, began to do her hair and makeup and she noticed horrible bruising all over Marilyn's face and shoulders and reported it to management. On October 6, 1954, 10 months after they had married, Marilyn Monroe and her attorney, Jerry Geisler, stepped outside her home and announced to the press that she and Joe DiMaggio were getting a divorce due to, quote, mental cruelty. And in a letter written to Marilyn to his wife at the time of this announcement, Joe DiMaggio said, quote, I love you and I want to be with you. There is nothing I would like better than to restore your confidence in me. My heart split even wider seeing you cry in front of all of those people. And this was a big deal. I forgot the amount, but Marilyn Monroe wore a dress out in front of her home to make this announcement. And she looked shaken. She was shook. 
Uh, She was crying. She was a mess. And again, tabloid fodder. But this dress that she wore to make this announcement went for like $60,000 in an auction house a couple of years ago. As the divorce was being processed, Marilyn was again completely alone in a world where she was actually its biggest superstar. So what does she do? She went to go live with one of her closest friends, Frank Sinatra. Frank and Ava Gardner had broken up a handful of times during their also extremely volatile, filled with domestic violence and physical abuse marriage. He, like Joe, was notorious for physically abusing all of his spouses and girlfriends, and he would brutally attack Ava Gardner while he was drunk. But he had always been super kind to Marilyn, so she went to his home to stay. It only took a couple weeks until Marilyn Monroe and Frank Sinatra began to have a sexual relationship. And that's basically all it was, and it didn't last. They remained very, very close friends, but the romantic part didn't even start up and didn't last. Just a few months later, Marilyn met playwright Arthur Miller, who most of you probably know from books that you read in high school, like Death of a Salesman or The Crucible. Marilyn loved intellectual men, and Arthur was the height of intellectualism. She was a sponge for knowledge and hung on every single word. And, you know, a fun fact about Marilyn... Marilyn Monroe was actually incredibly smart herself. I think so many people believe the typecasting of different actors or actresses that they see in Hollywood or see in films, especially if they're totally typecast. But Marilyn Monroe, she was very smart. She was very self-aware and she prided herself in owning more than 400 books, having read each and every one of them. She was a voracious reader. In fact, once when a director found her sitting on a set engrossed in a book, Letters to a Young Poet, he asked her how she chose it. She said, quote, well, on nights when I've got nothing else to do, I go to the Pickwick bookstore on Hollywood Boulevard, and I just open books at random. Or when I come to a page or paragraph I like, I buy that book. So last night I just bought this one. Is that wrong? Arthur Miller and Marilyn Monroe dated in secret. They didn't want to create tabloid hysteria. This was short-lived about a year when press caught wind that they were planning to get married. In June of 1956, a reporter was following them by car, and as Arthur Miller began to make evasive maneuvers to get away, the reporter crashed his car, killing a female passenger. Marilyn became hysterical when she heard the news, and their engagement was immediately announced. Her relationship to Arthur Miller made sense for her and to her. He was a narcissistic writer who wanted arm candy, and she was the beautiful actress who loved books, intellectualism, and reading. However, due to her typecasting, the newspapers ran headlines like Beauty and the Brains, The Egghead and the Hourglass, basically any iteration of he's smart and she's a dumb bitch that you can think of. Marilyn would end up taking 18 months off from Hollywood, instead spending it in support of her husband. By all accounts, she was briefly doing better until marital problems began to creep up again. In 1959, Marilyn returned to Hollywood and was set to star in Some Like It Hot, and filming began. It was a catastrophe. She was constantly intoxicated on alcohol and pills. She would be hours late to production or not show up at all. Producers would have to bribe or then drag her from her trailer to the set. She was unable to remember any lines whatsoever, and she was a, she was wasting ungodly amount of film for the takes, which at that time, it was incredibly expensive for the studios to go through that much actual physical film. In one film, in Some Like It Hot, it took her 40 takes, 40, just to deliver the line, where's the bourbon, correctly. Three words, 40 takes. Two of her co-stars in the film, Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon, heckled and bullied her relentlessly, as they had never encountered such unprofessionalism in their entire careers. Marilyn also had endometriosis and was carrying a child, Arthur Miller's child, but then she had a miscarriage. All of this on top of her already fragile mental health and addiction issues. Some Like It Hot was an absolute blockbuster and led to Marilyn winning a Golden Globe for Best Actress. This was the absolute height of her career, but her marriage to a man that she loved very much was completely unraveling. The marriage lasted only five years and came to an end in 1961 after Marilyn discovered Arthur Miller's personal journal. Unable to curb her curiosity, she opened it and read what he had written. Arthur had confessed that he regretted marrying her. She wasn't what he thought she was. She was a child, not a woman. She wasn't as intelligent as he'd hoped. 
And worse, worst of all, he actually pitied her. He also expressed concerns that his own career would be damaged or take a hit because he was married to her. He had heard that Laurence Olivier, one of Marilyn's co-stars in the movie The Prince and the Showgirl, called her a spoiled brat. In the journal, Arthur Miller agreed with Laurence Olivier's sentiment and called his wife a bitch. That moment devastated Marilyn more than almost anything in her life. More than anything, she longed for a father figure. She loved intellectual men, and she found a combination of the two of those, the father figure and the intellectual, in Arthur Miller. He was a little bit older than her. She thought that she'd finally found security, emotional, physical, and financial, but it definitely was not meant to be. As the divorce was getting finalized, Marilyn Monroe was in shambles. She was drinking heavily while taking medications. She was spiraling into a deafening depression. She wasn't showing up on shooting days. Two different psychiatrists had recently diagnosed her as paranoid schizophrenic, just like her mother, and she had just started working on the film The Misfits. And The Misfits was written by her soon-to-be ex-husband, Arthur Miller. It was a script that he had written as a gift for Marilyn. So it perfectly mirrored their previous relationship problems, and that was mentally and emotionally taxing to her. That impacted her greatly. But this is really where her addiction issues started to shine. Um, At this point, she had both a doctor and a psychiatrist. She was prescribed uppers to take when she woke up in the morning to keep her going. And then she was prescribed downers at night. And she would drink all day long on both of them. The Misfits was plagued with Marilyn's toxic behavior, her drunkenness, her addictions, and her tardiness. She was volatile on set and frequently flew off on everyone around her. In fact, there's rumors that she even flew off, like flew off on a child. However, the film was completed in November of 1960, just a couple months before co-star Clark Gable's death. Gable's widow would go on to blame Marilyn for his death entirely, further sending her down into a spiral. Marilyn Monroe's behavior spiraled out of control so badly that in February of 1961, Marilyn voluntarily committed herself to the Payne Whitney Psychiatric Ward in New York City, not understanding that she was signing away her rights. She did not have the ability to leave at any point. And her stay there made it all worse. An institution is not a place for like a high maintenance superstar of the 1960s. They locked her in a padded room. Men looked at her. They stared at her. They tried to actually touch her and sexually abuse her. And more than anything, she didn't feel safe. She had to get out. She called all of her associates, everyone that she knew, family, friends. No one would help her. But Joe DiMaggio answered her call for help. In fact, Joe DiMaggio was the only man Marilyn Monroe ever trusted which is horrifyingly sad considering that he physically abused her so brutally. But she called him and he answered and immediately drove to the Payne Whitney institution. He drove to the hospital, banged on the door and said, quote, I'll give you five minutes to get her out here or I'll tear this fucking place apart brick by brick. And they immediately brought her out. He brought Marilyn back to his training camp in Florida and nursed her back to health. He helped her recover through yet more gynecological surgeries, letting her stay with him in his home. And that's something that a lot of people aren't aware of. Marilyn had a whole handful of gynecological surgeries. She had endometriosis, uh, so she had multiple surgeries for that. She also was trying to actively have a child with Arthur Miller, so she would have surgery supposedly to allow her to have children. She had a whole series of of surgeries uh, in that way. And She was pregnant multiple times throughout her life, and every single one ended in a miscarriage. So more loss, more devastation. Joe saw Marilyn actively improving in body and mind and begged and pleaded with her to leave Hollywood and the institution that was slowly killing her. Except she was still at the absolute pinnacle of her fame, and she wasn't about to stop. So feeling better, Marilyn put her toes back in the pool. And in one of my absolute favorite quotes by her, she said, quote, men, they're all the same. They're just stupid and they like big boobs. I can be smart when it's important, but men don't like that. 
it really showed how self-aware she was. She knew why she was famous and she was in on the joke. She understood it. In April of 1962, she began to film what would be her final unfinished project, Something's Got to Give, co-starring Dean Martin. The project got off on the wrong foot because after moving back to Hollywood, Marilyn had immediately slipped into her old habits of alcohol, pills, and depression. Not only that, but due to her gallbladder and gynecological surgeries, she had lost an insane amount of weight. At this point, she was actually the skinniest she had been her entire life. She was sick. She was very, very, very sick and in pain. But instead of concern, the studio absolutely loved it. Everyone made comments about how good she looked. Why hadn't she done that sooner? Look at her taking care of herself. They were furthering her already vast insecurities. And the studio and production team itself had zero sympathy for her. Screenwriter Walton Bernstein said, quote, Yes, this is a sick woman, but this is a movie star who's getting her way and who doesn't give a damn about anybody else and is being destructive and self-destructive. She was fired from Something's Got to Give after missing 17 out of 30 shooting days. 17 out of 30. The co-star and longtime friend Dean Martin made a stand and said, nope, that he too would quit if Fox wouldn't rehire Marilyn back on. The studio refused and the production halted. Now, before she'd been hired for Something's Got to Give, a studio producer, Henry Weinstein, no, not of the Harvey variety, just random guy, said that Marilyn had been asked by the White House, JFK's brother-in-law, Peter Lawford, also an actor, specifically by him, to sing happy birthday to President John F. Kennedy on May 9th of 1962. And Marilyn, terrified beyond belief, did. It is, again, one of the most epic, iconic, and most important moments in American pop culture history. I mean, it crisscrossed politics and pop culture. It was something entirely different. This moment of her singing happy birthday in that raspy, seductive voice filled with innuendos, None of that helped to dampen the rampant rumors of this big affair with JFK. And that's the thing. At that time, newspapers didn't report on extramarital affairs of presidents or dignitaries. It just, it was unheard of. It was an understood fact that men had mistresses and that newspapers would indulge them with the respect of keeping quiet. They earned it. That was just a normal part of life. However, the tabloids, the trash mags, were rife with speculation. And that meant that all of America was too. The women talked about it. The men and the women talked about it on their dinner table in the offices. That particular performance did nothing to quell those rumors. In fact, it lit them on fire. And if you're wondering, First Lady Jackie Onassis Kennedy, she blamed Robert Kennedy. She said, quote, he orchestrated the whole goddamn thing. Columnist Dorothy Kilgallen said, quote, nothing like making love to the president and the direct view of 40 million Americans. This was a huge, huge, huge moment and was on the cover of every single newspaper. That was May 9th, 1962. Just three months later, on August 4th, 1962, 36-year-old Marilyn Monroe was found dead in her Brentwood, Los Angeles home. I'm not going to get into specifics on surrounding her death for this episode. I'm going to go into a lot of detail on the second episode because there is, there's just simply too, 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 too much to cover um, on this that ties into additional, uh, additional, additional things. So for the sake of this episode, she died in August of 1962. When she died, Joe DiMaggio was really her only family. Joe DiMaggio was the one who flew from New York to Los Angeles. United Airlines actually held a flight and a plane just for him. He was the one who identified Marilyn's body. He was also the one who organized a small private funeral. It was invitation only, and he would not allow anyone from Hollywood uh, to really even attend it. He blacklisted 99% of the people that Marilyn Monroe knew because he blamed them for sending her on a spiral to her death. He said, quote, if it wasn't for them, she would still be here. It was then him who personally designed her headstone. And then every week until his death from lung cancer in 1999, Joe DiMaggio had fresh roses delivered to Marilyn Monroe's crypt twice a week. 
He never remarried, and on his deathbed, his last words were, I'll finally get to see Marilyn again. And that's it for today, guys. We are going to stop right there. We are going to stop at Marilyn Monroe's death, and then starting in part two, we are going to break down what happened, trace back the final steps, the last 24 hours, the last day of Marilyn Monroe's death. Uh, We're going to cover her relationship with the Kennedy family, as well as all of the conspiracy theories and even information uh, and documentation and, and secret FBI files that have been made public about her death. A lot is coming. It's just an absolute rabbit hole. I did not realize just how tragic that Marilyn Monroe was as a human being. It almost feels just dirty to me to see the pop art and the Andy Warhol of her everywhere and knowing why she was the way that she was, how she was mistreated and mishandled and abused by literally every single person she pretty much came into contact with. Uh, There's also been a lot of talk that she may have had Um, on top of paranoid schizophrenia or may not have been paranoid schizophrenic, that she may have also had um, histrionic personality disorder, uh, which is a doozy as well. So there's a lot to cover here, which we will be covering in the next episode. Uh, There's, Like I said, there's a handful of conspiracy uh, theories. There's a missing diary. There's FBI uh, tapping her home. There is a lot to discuss and cover. Uh, So that's what the next episode is going to be. This is just the foundation. But that is it for today, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Again, you are listening to We Saw the Devil. I'm Robin. Please feel free to check out our website at wesawthedevil.com. Uh, from there, you can go to patreon.com forward slash we saw the devil. If you're digging the show and want to throw out a few bucks or monthly support it, you can do so there. And again, super excited to announce that next week I will be interviewing uh, attorney Joel Schwartz, who was Russ Faria's attorney, uh, the man who Pam Hupp framed for his wife Betsy Freya's murder. Until next crime.